good. So Alex, all set for you? Yeah, let's, let's do it. Just perhaps wait a couple of minutes more. Some more people will come. Um, and after you, we can start. Yeah, sure. Our friend Callum is on. Yeah. I think Shapur generally attends. Shapur has not come yet, maybe. <laughs> yeah. There's also Declan. Yeah. 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 yeah good. Very good. Seven five will start, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Alex, uh, total how many slides approximately? How many number of slides? Just to know. Um, around 100, 110, something like that. Okay. It's a quite long uh, presentation, so. Yeah, it's welcome to see, you know, all our professionals, they would like to see your uh, slides and your good experience. Uh, Abdullah, it's uh, live on YouTube, I believe. Yes, now we're live on YouTube and we're recording. Yeah, I think if somebody can uh, go on live and uh, see also, correct? Yep, I'll start sharing the link. Uh, are you posting uh, that link, uh, YouTube live? Maybe someone can see from outside, maybe. Yep. Yeah, in the WhatsApp, if you can share, I'll share to the people. Good, thank you, Abdullah. Received. In one minute, we'll move, we'll start. Mm -hmm. I think uh, yeah, I think we can start. Good evening. Uh, we welcome you all on behalf of Institute of Structural Engineers. Uh, today we have going to be a wonderful session by Mr. Alex, our speaker, Mr. Uh, just to brief about Alex, uh, Alex is a postgraduate in structural engineering in 2003 and is a graduate member of uh, Institute of Structural Engineers. He worked across the globe and namely UAE, Saudi, Hong Kong, as well as UAE, uh, in Portugal. He's got a wide uh, experience across the globe. And he started his career as a technical director in a design build steel contractor. Later, he moved to UAE in 2008. He started working in a, one of the biggest firms, he's called Hydro Consulting. Then, later, he joined Miras Holding and North 25 as a senior manager of structures, where he's uh, worked uh, many prestigious projects like the Beach, City Walk, Marsal Sea, and one of the great jobs is Dubai Eye. Dubai Harbor, Master Billing, and Cruise Terminal, Madinat Jumeirah Living. Uh, to name a few, I think uh, he's got experience of uh, consultant 
as well as subcontractor and client. So we foresee his experience is more valuable to our professional engineers. Hence, we requested to have a session with him. Thanks for uh, accepting our invitation, Mr. Alex. Uh, yeah, uh, just to uh, just to have some protocol for Zoom. Uh, this is our uh, first webinar, uh, first CPD webinar, I should say, and this is a second webinar from institution. Uh, Regarding protocols, uh, we, we take up uh, question and answers at the end of the session. Uh, all attendees can see the bottom, there's a question and answer uh, uh, icon. You press it, you can post your questions. We'll select questions and uh, ask uh, our, uh, our panelists or our speaker today. Uh, in addition, uh, if anybody has got a doubt which we cannot clarify, you can contact me or Mr. Alex uh, separately. Uh, and we have a poll at the end that you can attend. Uh, that's all for my side. And uh, take the platform, Mr. Alex. Thanks for accepting our invitation again. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. So good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Alexander Carrico. Uh, and uh, thanks for joining this webinar from the Institution of Structural Engineers about structural consultancy uh, from a client perspective, lessons learned which in a way uh, is reflecting 12 years of experience uh, on both sides of the fences. So either uh, consultant, either, either client. Uh, the presentation, it's, uh, it's quite long, so um, uh, we need to start immediately. But at the end of the presentation, if we have time for, for questions, please, uh, please put your questions uh, to my colleagues and we'll try to, uh, to reply to you. Uh, if not possible, again, feel free uh, to drop me one email on my personal email, and uh, I'll try to revert back to you as, as soon as possible. So I'll start with this slide. It's a bit of a, a dilemma uh, in everybody uh, involved in the process. So in a way, everyone wants the best of the three worlds, so quality, time, and cost. But sometimes it's difficult when we push on quality, so we get... Uh, uh, things that uh, take more time and uh, add more cost to uh, to the project. Uh, other way around, if we push to get cost-effective solutions in short period of time, uh, we lose uh, quality. I have a different uh, opinion uh, about this, in particular about consultancy. And when I'm talking about consultancy, it's structures, MEP, architect, anything. Uh, and we'll see this uh, end of the presentation. So over the presentation, I'm going to talk about um, a bit of scope of works, basis of design, authority requirements, quality of deliverables, lack of QQC, optimized solutions, cost, basement waterproof, and marine structures coordination. Um, perhaps uh, in a in few points, I'll, I'll just uh, go straight away. Um, and I'll just put this uh, in here as a reference because you all know that, so it's just, just for, for reference. So scope of works, we have uh, different types of, of, of approach, a traditional design, uh, sales spec, design and build in the early works. Uh, you all know in the traditional uh, approach, we run from concept to schematic detail, tender IFC. Uh, normally in these situations, we always ask for three structural options, pros and cons, and consultant recommendation. It's important uh, uh, to understand that the number of changes between uh, detailed design and IFC uh, shall be restricted to a minimum to avoid variations later on with the contractor. A sales spec is just simple, a concept design with the one optimal structural solution uh, with all uh, indicative sizes and reinforcement rates so we can feed the cost consultant in addressing a cost. Design and build, uh, it's a bit more, so we need to add uh, a schematic design. Uh, so GAs, structural dimensions, reinforcement rates, along very important, this particular point, so employer requirements, which are the basis of design uh, for the design and build contractor and the performance specifications. Um, uh, it's, it's also important to understand the, the requirements of the enabling uh, works in the, the early works 
to start to, to start uh, works on site as early as possible. As you know, uh, the authorities uh, in the UAE uh, as a standard, since the project launch, uh, you have six months to start the work on site. So in that, that way, it's important that at least we have a substructure package or shoring filing so we can start uh, the, the, the works on site. It's also important to, to, to understand uh, for piling as an example, if, if our project has piling, um, anything related to geotechnical investigation with foundation recommendation, um, wind tunnel assessment, third part structural uh, assessment, all these should be completed to, to feed in the, the pile design. This is one, of, one example uh, that I captured from one of my projects in, uh, in the old, uh, long time back. Uh, so um, types of piles, uh, the reactions at the piles, pile length, number of piles, uh, coordinates, very important, uh, pile cutoff level, end to level. Moving on, um, so if, if our structure uh, involves piling, it's important that, that the consultant has a substructure package, uh, fully covers the detail of the pile caps, draft, and all the starter bars, so the contractor can start the activities on site. If we don't have piles, uh, my suggestion, uh, and I believe the consultants, they should provide all the detailed information from, from ground floor, so to allow straight away the, the site uh, works. So basis of design, um, I'll be try to be quick on this. So you, you all know that it's just for reference. So code and standards, uh, design loads, uh, design groundwater, durability, reinf uh, reinforced concrete uh, cover, fire resistance, concrete slow grades, uh, quick reference to the soil report, temperature loads, and stiffener modifiers. So again, code and standards, uh, design loads, fire truck, um, this is important to capture and to, to understand the difference between existing groundwater and the design groundwater that you should take into your design. As a standard, the consultants, um, after the geotechnical investigation, they add one extra meter on the existing groundwater. And sometimes this could be tricky and uh, uh, how can I say, uh, turn into problems uh, further on. In my suggestion is you should understand uh, what could be the design groundwater and this should be the, the, the design groundwater that you should consider for your stability, for your design and also to, to define the basement waterproof. Durability, concrete covers, fire resistance, just for reference, uh, concrete uh, and steel grades, um, a quick reference to the soil report to guide everybody. It's, a, it's all about information. Temperature loads. Um, I provided here all the theory. So we have two types of uh, temperature loads approach. You have a constant membrane strain in the linear uh, plate membrane uh, that will, will cause bending. Um, I'm not going to, to all this theory. It's all here. Um, and I believe the, the PDF, uh, uh, presentation will be provided later on and you always can come uh, to the presentation and, and digest this uh, in, in better detail. Um, here I did a, a quick example on sub 2000 uh, on a fixed uh, beam on, on both supports with a uniform temperature. And as you can see the 720 uh, kilonewtons I'm getting in my, in my beam uh, reflects exactly the end calculations. In the same way, if I apply a gradient temperature in the same beam, you can see I have a moment of 60 kilonewtons per meter constant, and the end calculations are reflecting exactly the same results. Um, this particular example is a simply supported beam uh, with a uniform temperature. Uh, so alpha delta T uh, L, it, it will give you the elongation. And as you can see, match also uh, sub 2000 results. This is a gradient temperature on a simply supported beam. Um, and uh, as well uh, reflects uh, the, the end calculations. So curvature, uh, it's equal to moment over EI. 
you have here the, the stiffness coefficient, coefficient uh, on the supports. And if you follow this approach, you will get the same results as SAP 2000. Um, this particular case is a uniform temperature on a continuous beam, which is exactly the same. In this one, uh, I think will reflect the most of our cases. So it's a gradient temperature on a, on a continuous uh, beam or where we can have, as an example, uh, extensive portion of slab, uh, fully restrained uh, either on the perimeter, basement walls, uh, and internally with shear walls and columns. As you can see, I believe you can see my cursor, the reactions, this is equivalent also to uh, post-tension calculations. So people that um, design post-tension are very familiar with this approach and, the, and it's exactly the same. So um, as you can see here, so the reactions on SAP 2000 show 17.5 kilonewtons and the, the, the middle support 34.99. So if, if I do the end calculations, you can see in here 1838, 36 apologies, and the 19 kilonewtons per meter, it's not giving the same result as sub 2000. And the, why is that is, is the question. So sub 2000 has other uh, finite element tools like uh, uh, Abacus, uh, Robot, uh, Strand 7, uh, at least as a beam mem, uh, how can I say, beam mem member, uh, they work with six degrees of freedom per node. So on one node, you have a, a stiffness matrix six by six. Uh, this is the coefficient, the stiffness coefficient uh, on, on the members, so on the beams, either you have a unitary displacement or a unitary uh, rotation, which will plug in, uh, in, in into uh, sub 2000. So this is the full element. So uh, stiffness matrix 12 by 12, and the reason why uh, my, so again, coming back, uh, my sub 2000 and then calculations are not giving the same results, it's because of the shear deformation. So um, sub 2000, uh, it comes with the, with the Timoshenko uh, finite element, which is different from all the Bernoulli theory, which I consider in my uh, end calculation approach. So, if you remove the shear deformation uh, from sub 2000 as a override stiffness modifier, so you can see sub 2000 comes exactly the same as the Euler Bernoulli uh, theory. So, moment 90 kilonewtons per meter. So, stiffness modifiers, you always, uh, you all also uh, know that very well. It's all in ACI 318. Um, you can have different approach in between uh, models, so SLS and ULS, um, circular one on one uh, for wind and seismic, and circular 237 for third part review. So you are all familiar with that. I just put it here as, as a reference. Um, and now we're going to start a little bit on quality of deliverables, which I believe. Um, will constitute an approach of uh, having structural basics, simple things uh, that you easy can control, you easy can do in checks and easy double check if the output of your uh, software, it, it's, it's right, is giving the right answer or the wrong answer. So it's important to understand how the geometry properties comes from. So area, inertia, uh, flexure models, radius of gyration, um, Understanding the geometry properties for a general section, this is very important on, on post-tension uh, calculations, neutral axis, getting the inertia using the parallel axis theorem, understanding the difference between elastic models and plastic models, um, understanding uh, the difference between elastic region and plastic region, again, elastic, um, distribution in plastic distribution, uniaxial strain and stresses elongation, um, axial stresses and bending stresses. So axial stresses, uh, compression force over the area, bending stresses, a moment over the elastic models, um, 
buckling, effective length, um, all are critical load, slenderness, um, again, buckling, you, it's all here. You can come here and uh, get yourself familiar with all these things. Um, stress block concrete section, um, first and second Newton law. So an object will not change its motion unless act on by an unbalanced force. Second Newton law, force is equal to uh, mass uh, multiplied by the acceleration. In here, I'm going to jump these slides uh, for, for now. So it, it, it's all about dynamics. Uh, it's to give you an appetite uh, on structural dynamics, but we'll come uh, to this later if we have time. Um, so natural frequencies, uh, modes of vibration, first, second, third, understanding and estimating uh, the, the natural frequency depending on your uh, structural supports and mass distribution. Um, understanding how you can uh, approach uh, an approximate fundamental period based on UBC 97 or ASK 705, real light method. Uh, preliminary sizes for concrete, for steel, uh, rules of thumbs. You all need to be comfortable with, the, with these things uh, at, at all times. So, typical rates for reinforcement in different types of elements, minimum a percentage of reinforcement, maximum percentage of reinforcement. As an example, when I see uh, people coming to me in the, uh, with columns with more than 4% reinforcement, something is fishy. So it's the kind of uh, things you need to, to feel and to, to try to control as much as possible. Third Newton law, action reaction. Actually, this is a very good uh, thing to, to do a check on, on the structure and, and to, to check if, if your structural output in from your structural software, it's giving the right answer. So if you are putting 10 kilonewtons of force, you need to have 10 kilonewtons of reaction. The same thing happens with, with mass. So in checks, so understanding the, the, the types of uh, the different the deflections on different types of uh, supports and loads, uh, deflection limits, moments. Um, I'm going to talk a, a little bit now of, about steel structure. Um, I, I choose to, to touch uh, in particular Eurocode 3, which I'm very familiar and I use, I'm using for a long time, but, but in a way, um, the results are equivalent to uh, American Institute's steel construction. So just a different approach, but the, the results in the end of the day are very similar. So it's all about stresses, loads, uh, displacement. It's all about structural, mechanical of structures. So um, compression resistance um, and the flexural resistance. So the compression resistance, so the compression capacity of the section, it's the area multiplied by the grade of your steel over a safety factor. However, if you want to introduce the buckling resistance, you need to multiply this section capacity by a reduction factor. In the same way, uh, you need to do the same for, for flexure. Um, so this is why you approach uh, a column buckling, flexure buckling, uh, torsional in fact, flexure buckling, and the, again, the, the bending, so the bending, so the, the bending capacity of your section, if you use class one or two plastic, so uh, you use the plastic models over the, the grade of your steel uh, over a, a safety factor. If you use class three elastic, you need to use the elastic uh, modulus. Um, I'm not going to talk about shear, it's all here, so you can easily uh, come and understand this. In the same way, so, you have uh, on the flexure capacity a uh, reduction factor for lateral torsional. So as you can see, uh, reduction factor lateral torsional, um, which you define as this uh, equation, which is all related to slenderness, slenderness of, of your member. So to, to understand this in, in better detail, I just put here a, a quick example. So it's a simply supported beam with a compression force of 325 kilonewtons 
and subject also to a distributed load, which will give bending. So as you can see, um, the governing case in this particular case, um, it's the weak axis, so which, so which will give you the lower uh, reduction factor. And in the same approach, you have uh, uh, a, a reduction factor for, for lateral torsional for flexure. When you go to these numbers in the just, so this is ETABS model in the um, sub 2000 uh, output if you design a steel and in, in, in my spreadsheet reflects the same way uh, sub 2000. So to, to try to understand this uh, in, a, in better detail. So this is the, the section capacity. This is the, the, the buckling capacity. So it's this figure multiplied by this reduction factor. And in four moments, so you have the flexure capacity of your section in this uh, figure. It's exactly this 306 multiplied by the reduction factor for lateral torsional buckling. When you plot uh, the ratio, so this 0 0.331 comes from the compression load divided by this figure, and uh, 0 0.598 comes from 120, which is at the moment we have in our beam, over uh, 200.8. And this will give you this ratio. Um, so again, you can fully design, uh, do the analysis in your, in your tabs in the sub 2000 and also do the steel design. However, you need to understand one important uh, uh, factor, which is uh, this K factor. As a standard, uh, the output of sub 2000 uh, always comes uh, scrambled. So these figures that uh, in a way demonstrate the uh, unbraced length, they always come twisted and you need to go one by one and, and please note this one by one to ensure that these numbers are correctly and adjusted to your beam, uh, to your column, to whatever. So as you can see, I put uh, one, I overwrite to one and one. And as you can see, the ratio increased slightly. However, it's not the same as mine. We'll get there in a bit. So, in the same example, so what I did now, I put the bracing on the weak axis. And as you can see, the, the, the governing case is not the weak axis anymore. It's, it's the strong axis. So the buckling res resistance of, of my column or my beam comes from the section um, capacity over this reduction factor, which is equal to that one. Sorry, that one, exactly. In the same way, so the moment multiplied by this one, sorry, this one comes exactly like that. And the ratio in this particular case comes to 0.6 to 1. So drops, because I put a propane on the weak axis. So I'm giving extra capacity to my column just as to put a bracing. Simple, cannot be simple that, than, than this. And as you can see in here, so this is the output of sub 2000. So the ratio 595, it's not the same as 6 to 1. And why is that? So the reason why sub 2000 is not giving uh, the same results of my spreadsheet, it's simple. Uh, in my spreadsheet, I'm using the accurate uh, section properties of my section. So in sub 2000, use this uh, approximation. As you can see, rectangular sections, if you just check the cross section, the area uh, in sub 2000, it's less than the real area uh, of, of the section. And this is why these figures are, are different, nothing else. And the, all this comes to this slide, which, which is very important. It's one of my import, uh, most important slides. So structural engineers are not software operators. So we have uh, uh, super powerful computers uh, in our days, uh, advanced softwares that they do everything from input to the output, but we should not let softwares uh, controlling us, should be exactly the other way around. So we should be fully controlling the softwares from the input to the output. 
And the only way we can control it's knowing all these basic concepts, doing some end checks, some rule of thumb, thumbs, and, uh, and check the output of, of the softwares. And this is the best tools you can have a simple calculator or just use Excel. Um, I honestly believe that Excel, um, it's a, a powerful tool in the, in, in, in the programming tool for fools. You can do unlimited things with, the, with Excel. Jumping now to chapter five uh, about lack of QAQC. This is, is very important. So I understand that we running on tight schedules uh, with tight fees. In uh, most of the times, the consultants to to commit with the program in deadlines, they just put through uh, things out of their office without doing QAQC. But uh, I, I fully believe this is not in their best interest. And actually, no one's best interest. As I can see as an example, so this is, is, is from, from myself also. So I picked from uh, old projects I was engaged a long time back. Uh, so key plans without any reference, uh, uh, legends without any, any reference to, to submission dates, uh, revisions, so no one can track anything, uh, typo mistakes, uh, detail for structural stairs without any SSL and FFL information. So uh, my suggestion in this particular case, uh, just take a snapshot from the architectural um with all this information in plus the structural details doing that uh you can give this to to any contractor and they can easily do the shop drawing with all the information without any mistakes or some sort of coordination um again this is picked from one project i did long time back so um my opinion changed a little bit so i thought that in here all the information is there, but now I have a different perspective. And uh, I believe all the breakdowns, uh, thicknesses, densities, remarks, users, user description, uh, fire truck loads, MEP planes, all this information should be clear here as much as possible. Um, this, this should be in, in your best interest uh, and also provide all the information to guide everybody and to guide the contractor. Um, this is, uh, it's something, I don't know where this comes from, uh, but as you can see, waterproof biodiverse with 200 millimeters, definitely uh, no one did any QAQC uh, on, 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 this, on these drawings. So uh, when, when the consultants, uh, they take, put things out of the office without doing any QAQC, so this reflects extra time, uh, they burn fees, they, they burn uh, extra time, uh, they, they do, they need to do the work again. And uh, I, I strongly suggest uh, to do this all times before sending any package out of the office. Talking now a little bit of uh, optimized solutions, I picked two, uh, two points, so columns and piles. Let's start with the columns and start to understand the difference between a column and a wall. So this is ACI 28, it's all there. So column is preliminary to take compression loads. In the wall, it's horizontal, uh, a vertical member also with a horizontal length to thickness ratio than three, uh, mainly used to take lateral loads from seismic and wind. The problem is, um, uh, we, we need to understand also uh, uh, two more concepts. So the difference between sway and non-sway and the difference between the P delta small and P uh, delta big, which, which is in here. I'll just put here a quick reference. Um, to understand if, if your structure or your story is sway or non-sway, you can easily uh, check this stability index, which is the sum of your uh, gravity uh, loads over the lateral displacement, um, multiplied by the lateral displacement over the the lateral force that will produce that displacement uh, multiplied by the, the height of the story. If this stability factor is less than 0 0.005, and uh, I trust this reflects 95% of our projects. So you'll understand that your structure is, is non-sway. 
in detail. You don't need to do any sort of moment amplification factor uh, or doing, including your P delta analysis because your structure is just not same. Simple as this. In the other way, so if you multiply, if you um, replace this this figure in this equation, you understand that the, the, the moment amplification factor comes to 1.05. It's nothing, it's very small. However, if you go to the other extreme, if, if your structure is definitely a sway structure and the, is the, the stability index uh, goes uh, uh, around 0.2 or even higher, uh, 0.25. So this moment amplification factor comes of 1.25. So uh, definitely you need to do a, a moment amplification factor as a first approach. Uh, otherwise you need to consider uh, the P delta analysis. So this is a non-sway uh, design methodology. So here it's, it reflects ACI 318. Um, if we doing a small example to understand this in better detail. So we have a column 300 by 900 with almost a 4% of reinforcement. And as you can see, the moment amplification factor for non-sway, it's in the limit. So we cannot go above this. It's, it's, it's our limitation. And uh, the maximum we can go is 2,800 2, kilonewtons. We don't understand anything here because it's just numbers. But if you just plot a graphic to understand the demand of, of, of your column versus the, the column capacity, you can easily understand that we are not utilizing the full capacity of your column. And we are using 4% of reinforcement, which is a lot. Now, if you do the same column as a uh, um, square column 500 by 500, with just 1.5% of reinforcement using less quantity of concrete, we can almost double the load um, to get the limit, the upper bound of the moment amplification factor. And as you can see in here, we are utilizing the full capacity of your column. So this column, it's, it's cost effective. I understand that uh, in, in many projects, uh, as an example, residential, uh, we need to take care of uh, the architectural considerations. And the, normally the architects, they like slender columns, but it's important to understand that slender columns, they are adding uh, extra cost to, to the clients and uh, they are not providing cost-effective solutions. Talking about piles, uh, across we, UAE and I think Middle East. So we always have uh, sandy soils. And as a, a standard, the first layers of soil are loose, loose layers of sand, which are not contributing anything for the pile capacity. In that sense, so imagine if you need to put a pile from the ground floor until minus 60 meters, you are wasting off of the pile length, uh, which are not contributing uh, anything for for the pile capacity. This is the same the same plot reflects the same same way. So we have these three three options: uh, option one, two, and three. In this particular case, we have 150 piles with 20 meters uh, depth. Second second option: one 125 piles, uh, a little bit longer. And option three. We have the same 125 piles uh, in a smaller diameter uh, and uh, deeper. And if we do a cost, a quick cost assessment, we understand the option three, it's the cheaper. So if you provide less number of piles, smaller diameters and deeper piles, in a way you are, you are uh, reaching uh, some cost efficiency. Uh, however, uh, please note, you have a, a limitation. And the limitation, it's the, it's the concrete limitation, which is 25% of the FCU over the area. So, um, I mean, you, no matter if you have a pile with 100 meters, say, as, a, as an example, you cannot engage the full um, geotechnic capacity of the pile because you have a concrete limitation. So it's, it's, it's important to understand also um, how these limitations work together. Talking um, now, jumping on, on chapter seven about waterproof. I put three examples. So, uh, shallow foundations without groundwater, 
shallow foundations with groundwater and the basement uh, uh, waterproof, uh, sorry, basement substructures with groundwater. And the, I did this quick uh, uh, schedule comparison. So I'm not that important to people, they, they try to understand the, and to consider warranty, but to be honest with you, warranty doesn't tell me anything. What really tells me uh, it's the durability and the, how long the product, your waterproof will last uh, uh, in, in, in the structure that uh, needs to be life, uh, designed for a lifetime of 50 years. So in, if you have a shallow foundations without groundwater, I, I trust that this is the cheapest solution to coat rubberized liquid bitumen and, and that's it. If you have the same shallow foundations with groundwater, you can use one or two layers uh, SBS uh, four millimeters, which will give you a durability 20, 25 years. Uh, so you still have uh, extra 25 years, which can, can be taken uh, as the concrete cover. Uh, if you have uh, a basement uh, uh, um, structure subject to, to, to groundwater, say until 200 kPa, I can use, I think you can use uh, a two, two millimeters loose laid uh, PVC membrane um, with compartments. You can use also a bonded system, which I believe it's a bit uh, more uh, costly. However, I'm not in favor of this particular uh, system, simply because if something goes wrong and if you have water leakage, you don't have a backup system to, to repair your water leakage. In this particular case, uh, you have a backup system with compartments and flanges where uh, the, the suppliers, they inject uh, a resin uh, to leak, to seal the, the, the leakage. However, it's um, as a, a, a cons, so it's a trial and error. So they don't go there and they just, they just uh, inject a considerable portion uh, of, uh, of sealant to, to leak the, uh, and to seal the compartment. So they do little by the little. And this sometimes, uh, it's, it's, it's a bit annoying and can take uh, several months until the, the, the full basement is sealed. Um, talking a bit, the last uh, chapter, so marine structures coordination, you don't need to, to understand or to, to know how to, to design and to detail the marine structures, but it's, it's important to understand uh, what is what and do uh, proper coordination. So, understanding what is a setback exclusion zone, excavation limitations, uh, live load limitations, deep compaction constraints, and the negative skin friction, if any. So understanding uh, overall stability, so overturning, sliding, uh, bearing capacity and global stability failures. Um, understanding, again, setbacks, exclusion zones, excavation limitations. So, and it's all about the uh, safety of, of, of your marine structure. Uh, as a standard, the, the marine consultants, they all define this uh, in, the, in the marine and geotechnical guidelines. And the setbacks in the exclusion zones and the excavation limitations are just done to protect the marine structure. As an example, if you put a building here with piles, you definitely, when you when you drive the pile, you're going to damage the the jaw textile uh, in the rock revetment. Same way, excavation. If you excavate more than the excavation limitation, you may damage the jaw jaw textile. Um, so you need to to consider this uh, while doing your structure. So live load limitations and deep deep compaction uh, constraints. Same way. So. When, when the marine engineers, they design uh, these marine structures, they design with a surcharge load, I don't know, 20 kPa, uh, 30 kPa, something like that. So if you put here a structure that is uh, putting a surcharge load, live load, higher than that, definitely you are jeopardizing your structure stability and the stability of your marine structure. So you need to take this into consideration. In the same way, um, the deep compaction. So when when uh, these uh, islands, man-made islands, are done, so 
compaction, they put these uh, vibration uh, prones uh, in, inside in the inside pockets of them. And as you can see, these uh, uh, prones are, I don't know, 20, 30 meters, and they cannot uh, uh, come and compact these areas close to the, to the marine structures in the same way uh, as they do it inside. So there's, there's limitations. Even if you put a structure in here, you can have uh, excessive settlements and you damage your, your, your structure. Negative screen friction. So this can happen anywhere actually. So we need to understand while we are doing our geotechnical investigation, if there's any loose uh, pockets of, of soil uh, that uh, under uh, excessive loads on ground uh, can, can put extra loads on your pile. And the, what you need to consider is just a reduction in your pile capacity. Just considerations that you need to address uh, in, the, in the final recommendations of your geotechnical investigation. Uh, and it's all about this. It's all about safety. Safety uh, for on our structures and safety on, on the marine structures. So by doing all these things and taking into consideration all these structural basics um, and providing quality to all the project stages, I, I truly believe uh, we can achieve uh, time and cost-effective solutions uh, naturally. Um, I believe we still have time, 10 minutes. 10 minutes, so I'm going to jump going back again to the structural dynamics slides, just to give you uh, a bit of appetite for, for it. There we go, almost there. And that's it. So structural dynamics, this may, may seem uh, a bit complex, but it's not. And uh, I'm sure if you start to to touch this and to put your hands on, on the subject, after a while, this becomes very simple. Um, to understand, so the general equation of movement, it's mass over acceleration, uh, plus the damping multiplied by the velocity, plus the stiffness uh, multiplied by this displacement, which is equal to a force that varies in time. So this force can be simplified as a simple harmonic motion. So just a force that varies uh, within the time. This is a, a concept that um, it's, it's, it's really important to, to understand. And if you really uh, understand this and uh, beautiful things can happen. And the beauty of uh, understanding how you, you can address the general ma mass mode, it's you can turn a, a complex structure, you know, I'm saying a complex structure, a building with 500 meters uh, and so, into a, a simplified model, a multiple degree of freedom, uh, or even better, uh, uh, on a single degree of freedom with just one uh, one single degree of freedom, where the, the 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 dynamic properties of all models are exactly the same, are a perfect match, at least for for the first first and second mode of vibration, perhaps. Uh, I think it will be difficult to, to, to try to match the third and other modes, but for sure you can do that uh, on uh, equivalence on the first and second uh, mode of vibration. So doing that and understanding this concept, you can do, as I told you, uh, beautiful things. So uh, this is our harmonic excitation uh, response without damping. As you can see, it's constant within time. This is the same response. Uh, however, I plug it with the resonance or I did, I put the, the frequency of vibration exactly the same as the, the natural vibration of your structure. And as you can see, you have amplification uh, response. This is the same uh, response. However, uh, it will have 2% uh, of damping. And you can see the, the response drops within time. Doing that, so doing a one single degree of freedom and using the generalized mass mode, you can easily uh, plot in a, 
uh, in, in run uh, on a fraction of seconds, um, time histories, response spectrums. You just plot, uh, plot uh, also the, the upper uh, in uh, the up, sorry upper and lower uh, capacity of your structure bound. In, and as you can see, the structure it's 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 safe. You can also plot uh, wind in response spectrum responses, either shear or or moment, very effectively. Um, this uh, it's it's actually uh, how you design uh, a tuned mass dump. So it's it's uh, one single degree of freedom, which in 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 this particular case it's represented by a simply supported beam. And what I did, I put our auxiliary system, which is a tuned mast. So as you can see uh, on yellow line, you, can, you cannot see all because it will be very, very high. Um, so uh, the response of, of this uh, beam without auxiliary mass, uh, it falls on the resonance. So, so the, the difference, the, the, the relationship between frequencies are almost equal to one. And by introducing this uh, uh, tune mass, you split this yellow line into the, the purple line, purple, pink, something in between. So if you put a, a mass, auxiliary mass of 0.02 tons, you can work, uh, you stagger and you, you provide the band of frequencies where you can operate your, your system on the safe side. If you add more mass, this band of frequencies is increasing. So it, you can work in between 0.75 and something in between here, so 1.25. So this is exactly the same exercise, but in, in here, I'm plotting the response of your auxiliary system. So here is your beam, your one single degree of freedom, and in here is your auxiliary system, so the mass. Um, and it, it works the same way. Now, if you add on, on, on this exercise uh, a damping, so as you can see, I put a damping, so it's a tuned mass damping, uh, good things happen. So the amplitude of, of vibration gets reduced and your band of frequency gets increased. So as you can see here, I plot several examples with 10% of, of, of damping, which is the blue line. You have two waves, uh, a bigger amplitude and a smaller amplitude. But if you consider 70% of damping, as you can see, the amplitude gets considerably reduced in your band of frequencies where, you, where your structure can operate safely uh, gets considerably increased. So it's, it's, it's really good. Um, this is exactly the same example, but in this particular case, I'm, 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 I'm changing uh, this row. This row, it's, it's a factor uh, between the relationship between masses. Actually, I didn't put here the, the equation, but I can share with you later on. So doing that, you have the ability to, to put on or your structure or um, how can I say, uh, run away from undesired, undesirable frequencies, either this side or that, that side. And by doing so, you will put a, a, a safe structure. This is uh, exactly the same plot as, as before, but all in. in. So uh, in, in, in purple, as you can see, it's the response of your tune mass. However, if you put damping, this purple line gets into this green light. It really gets uh, lower. And the, the, the dark line, the blue, if you use uh, damping, it will become on this, uh, uh, sorry, where I am? There we go. On this uh, uh, cyan uh, color line, which your amplification comes really, really low. So with that said, if you want to limit the, the displacement of your structure, of your auxiliary structure, say, to, to 0 0.02 meters, it means you can run your structure uh, safe from this band of frequencies in here. So I don't know, from 0.75, almost, almost one. However, um, I consider here, oh, sorry, 
uh, a five millimeters limitation uh, for your structure. And as you can see, this cannot be achieved because simply uh, the, the response of your structure is around uh, 10 mils. So I'm afraid this is the best we can get at, at, at this particular example. And uh, that's it. So let, let me go to the end of the presentation. Uh, here we go. So uh, one of the strengths of a structural engineer lies on the ability of turning complex problems into simple com concepts. So uh, this is, is my vision and my perspective of structural engineer. Um, I, I hope you enjoy. Uh, I'm not sure if we have time uh, for uh, questions. I'm going to, to pass uh, the presentation to, to Sama and, uh, and uh, let's see how it goes. Thanks, Alex, for your uh, presentation. You, you are most welcome. My, my pleasure. <laughs> basics to the client uh, perspectives, few ideas, yeah. And we have very few questions. Uh, uh, to take up one question is, uh, okay, before going for questions, uh, we have a small poll. Hopefully I'll try to do that. Uh, I launch poll. Uh, please uh, poll it on the same screen. Well, I should say yes, right? Uh, yeah, 30 seconds, yeah. Uh, uh, question is about the, what initial precautions you will suggest while renovation and retrofitting of 10 to 20 year old structure? Um, it, it, it's a good question. So, so uh, I, I think, um, first of all, we need to understand uh, that the design lifetime of the structures are, are, are designed for, for 50 years. Yeah. So. If you want to refurbish in the, uh, how can I say, improve uh, a structure with 25 years old, um, you need to understand what, what are you doing? You, you want to increase the lifetime of the structure or you just want to, to make sure that that structure will last another 25 years. So this is very important to understand. Also, it's very important to understand the, the actual conditions of the structure, the state of the corrosion, uh, you know, and uh, so you, you can cover this uh, very well. So understanding uh, if straining works are required, uh, understanding if protective, uh, cathodic protection is required. So you need to understand all these uh, points. Okay. Another question is from Mr. Sharin. How can we know if the structure frame is sway or non-sway? And how is it correlated in terms of columns, slenderness, and design? So it's here. So I'll go back again to, to the slide. It's all in ACI. So it's about the stability uh, uh, index. So it's uh, ACI, so 10.10, uh, 5.2. So you just go here and it's easy. So you need to, it's the sum of your gravity forces over uh, the lateral displacement on your story over. Uh, divided by the, the, the lateral force, apologies, that will provide that, that lateral displacement over uh, multiply by the height of your story. And by doing so, you'll understand easily if your story is sway or non sway. Okay. So, so definitely, if, if, your, if your story is it's sway, perhaps you have problems with the lateral stability. And uh, my advice. Uh, perhaps it pop up uh, the the shear walls to ensure that that your uh, uh, structure is is is, is not sway. Okay. Uh, I think I'll ask one more question. One question from my side. See, actually, there is a question. Uh, what are the technical challenges? At least list one from each aspect of entity. Maybe a consultant perspective, or a client perspective, or a subcontractor perspective as a project process. What is the major major challenge in the current market? Technical. Uh, I, I don't mention about you know payments and all. <laughs> it's, uh, again, uh, it, it, it's cost. So we are living uh, uh, on strange times. Uh, cost definitely it's important to everybody, 
in the in that way we need to we have all the responsibility in what i'm saying all it's everybody involved in the process to provide the cost effective solutions um yeah i, I think is that so your, your call is about cost effective solution uh i mean my presentation again it's by delivering quality and the, by delivering quality at all stages uh, i think you you can naturally achieve uh, time and cost-effective solutions. This is my perspective um, of, of everything. Okay. A question from Mr. Waka, Waka's Mansur. How we can estimate the reinforcement rate at the concept stage for the client? So uh, it, it's a good question. So let me uh, go here again. So, we are not inventing the wheel. This is all uh, defined in the uh, specialty books, uh, engineer books. So uh, it's all there. So this is a, an approach and it's nothing more than that. So uh, it, it's benchmarks uh, that, that we can uh, uh, use in concept stage and, uh, and that's it. So for sure, uh, while we carry uh, the project, um, on on the advanced stages like schematic detail, these things they, they get uh, some ev evaluation, uh, and um, in, in these figures they definitely can change. However, as an example, if you have a slab with 200 kilonewtons per cubic meter, something is wrong. So it's 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 just a a bit of a feeling that all the engineers they, they need to have when they see uh, uh, the output of a soft, of software uh, giving uh, 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 a, a reinforcement rate that doesn't follow the, the, the benchmarks and the, the guidelines, they, they need to understand why is that, and not just giving uh, that outside of, of the office and the giving to the client. So Mr. Client, take this. So it's... Okay. Yeah. Uh... Another question related to the BIM. I don't know. This is. Uh, will you answer BIM questions? Um, we, we can try. <laughs> <laughs> so, in case of using BIM as a main modeling tool, what should be considered for high quality model and the proper interaction between the model and design? So, uh, so um, I, I believe again, the te technology uh, in our days, it's it's amazing and uh, can, can do wonderful things. Um, talking in, in particular about being in, in, in structures and how we, we check structures, I, I believe we only can use BIM as a full coordination with other disciplines like, uh, like GAs, like with MEP, uh, with architectural to ensure that there's no clashing with anything. However, when you go to, to the detail or, or, or the review of the structural detail, uh, I, I think it will be very difficult for, for uh, the consultants or the BIM specialists to add all the enforcement details into BIM and also to review everything on, on BIM. So I believe at least for a while, uh, we still need to, to go on the, the tools we have, uh, checking uh, things on a, 2D drawings, PDF, and uh, that's it. Let, let's see how the future will, where the future will take us. But I believe for now, um, there's no other way. Yeah, I think we'll take another couple of questions. Uh, one good question has come to you actually, a question from Mr. Fadi. How does the design and build model affect the quality of design and execution works in the project? It's a, it's a very difficult question. Tri good question, good and tricky. Um, I, I, I don't know how, how, how to answer that particular question. You know why? Because because the thing is, it's um, it, it will vary depending on on people. So some people they they may understand uh, how can I say they may understand one approach. Some other they will understand a, a different vision. So I, I think I'll pass on that one. Apologies. <laughs> Okay. No, I, I can, I think uh, maybe I, can I try answer for his question? Sure. 
actually uh, if a client is expecting a, a project like a very good quality or five star facility i expect a design build project may not be a right uh, direction well it is uh, a, it is a more functional facility if client wants to construct well I, I believe, yeah, uh, yeah. again again it depends on on variable uh, i mean many factors uh, again if if you have if you if you give to a, a design and build contractor a, a robust package as a schematic level fully coordinated with all the disciplines so uh, architectural mep with a good package of of employment requirements in the performance specifications which will guide the contract the contractor very well and if you have from your side uh, a strong uh, pmc uh, engineer that can overlook uh, during the design and build contract stage i, I believe the, the the quality could could be the same so uh, so what i'm saying is the design is is fully controlled yeah. Uh, so yeah. it, it, it has a lot of uh, variables. Uh, just to add, uh, my take is uh, if it is a functional facility, if client is looking, better to go for a design build. If a, if a facility is like a eye hand uh, wall facility, I expect design build may not be a right solution. That's what my take. Anyway, this is a debate. Of <laughs> Again, uh, it, it yeah. will depend on uh, yeah, several correct. variables. Yeah, good. Uh, before taking the one minute, uh, polls gone. Then I think there's a last question from Mr. Shapur. Mm -hmm. uh, are you aware of any benchmark in terms of kg of rebar per square meter for build up area? Um, we have, we have. So uh, there, there's a, a factor that, that you can use. So um, your your volume of concrete um, divided by the by the area, so the the B way, I believe, uh, you'll get a factor of 0 0.4, 0 0.5, and this will give you a good indication if your structure it's uh, it, it it's well designed, something like that. So, so it's a good, that's what actually. It's a good indicative indicative ratio uh, to to quickly estimate the the structure overall. But okay. but again, I mean, this is is also a bit uh, subjective because uh, all the money in your structure, it's not in the concrete, it's in the steel. So the, the steel it, it it plays a a bigger role uh, in terms of uh, structural cost to to the project. Yeah, I just uh, uh, before taking one question, uh, I'll share the results of the our poll just for information for the our attendees. It's good about 60% people, uh, no, 10%, yeah, 31%, good. Uh, I think any other questions? I believe we are covered, I think most of them, I think some of them, yeah. Okay, I think uh, that's the end of our session. I think, thank you very much, uh, um, Mr. Alex. Thank you, and, thank uh, you for the opportunity. Just to, Conclude uh, as an institution because there are 31 percent of the people like to associate looks. Uh, there are many people like to know the organization. Uh, regarding institution, we have uh, ISRT is called Institute of Structural Engineers, based from UK. We have a regional group which is actively working on uh, uh, promoting structural engineering uh, expertise and uh, uh, etc. Uh, here uh, we uh, in the institution we offer about various memberships along the memberships, graduate member, charter member, and fellow. Out of this, uh, we have a charter member where we have an exam across the globe. So if you have a person who are interested to go for exam, it will be a good exam to improve your skills in structural engineering. Please go through istructi.org for further details. Yeah, that's about it. Uh, and. Uh, we are. We came on online platform, which is Zoom, as you know. Uh, we like to bring more uh, such sessions because it's very friendly and it's uh, accessible to everybody. So, in future, uh, uh, it will be good for us to meet regularly in these challenging conditions. 
thank you very much thank you thank you so much Bye. and at last uh, mr abdullah uh, is our uh, secretary of the regional group thank you very much for his uh, support from back end he is the one uh, brain behind this all the online Indeed. platform <laughs> thank you abdullah yeah uh, thank, you thank you alex uh, yeah okay good bye good night okay good night